Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here, Thyrac Veteran 8888. Today we're going to be going through and fully disassembling and cleaning up a Finnish M39 service rifle. And uh, in this video I'm going to detail some of the things that I go over when I'm looking at Mosins, things that I look for when I'm buying them, uh, ways that I check for condition and shootability, making sure it's safe to shoot. Uh, so we're going to go through it and we're going to go ahead and clean this thing up a bit. There's some dried grease, preservatives, some oil that's dried all over the stock, so we're going to go through and clean it up some. This particular rifle was acquired through Classic Firearms out of Monroe, North Carolina. Great group of people to work with. They've got an entire inventory of these things in stock right now. If you've ever wanted to finish M39, now is definitely the time to do it. They're not getting any easier to find. They are unfathomably rare compared to standard 9130 service rifle. Um, check out some of our other videos. We've got another video called What Makes a Mosin Rare where we talk about some of the weird markings that you can look for if you're a collector and things like that and also what makes a Mosin desirable uh, because not all of them are uh, you know made to the same standard in terms of uh, rarity. Okay, uh, When you compare a Finnish M39 to something like a K31, uh, the fit and finish is excellent. Basically with the M39, what they ended up doing was they had a bunch of captured and leftover Russian uh, M39 or, or, or uh, M9130 service rifles. And uh, they took a bunch of them, pulled the barrels, ditched the stocks. The only thing that's Russian on this entire rifle is the receiver and the magazine. The bolt body, the bolt head, the connecting bar, basically the entire bolt assembly. Everything else on this rifle has been replaced by the fins. Uh, to make a vastly superior infantry rifle to what the Russians were using. They outfitted them with very good, high-quality barrels, improved sights, improved hardware, improved stocks with a pistol grip grafted into the stock. And uh, there's just a lot of things. A lot of these, they rework the magazine followers to, to be of what they call a jam-free arrangement. So many of the M39s, you're never going is to have issues with rim lock or anything like that. It's basically a vastly improved M9130 infantry rifle, kind of like a, the Cadillac of the Mosin family. Another thing they also did was they offered an adjustable front sight for windage, which is awesome. Uh, these are very high quality guns. We're going to go ahead and break into it. This is a very simple task. Uh, I would highly recommend if you're going to work on a lot of military surplus guns, just go on and pick yourself up a Brownells Magnetip Super Set. Uh, they're a little bit on the pricey side, but they've got a lifetime guarantee. They last forever. They work well. And it is an investment grade set of tools that will last you a lifetime. Uh, I would strongly recommend anybody that's serious about working on guns to invest in one of those toolkits because they're just great. Um, we're going to leave the uh, rifle chalked up here and we're going to go from muzzle to butt and go through and uh, go ahead and disassemble this guy. Uh, so this will cover disassembly, some light cleaning, we're going to look at the parts, inventory them. A lot of these receivers on these M39s are antique receivers. The fact that this receiver doesn't have a scrubbed marking like the Imperial markings or the Peter the Great markings that they put on the front of these hex receivers. And by the way, most all M39s are built off hex receivers. Uh, it tells me that this is probably an antique receiver. I'm going to venture to guess it could be a French, early French receiver, possibly a Tula or Ice Vec. Um, we're going to get it apart and have a look. Many of these M39s will have antique receiver uh, dates. I'll show you how to confirm the date on the receiver of your M39 in this video as well. So let's get started. We're going to get it apart, get it cleaned up. All right, we're going to work from the front of the rifle backwards. Obviously, open the bolt and inspect the chamber visibly. Make sure that it's not loaded. That's a given, guys. All right, so right out the gate, you can tell that there's definitely some differences from the standard 9130 going on here. What I like to do, part of my thought process when it comes to buying mill serps, primarily my purpose for a military surplus rifle, I mean, obviously collection purposes, but I like to get a gun that's a good shooter. And part of that is uh, if I'm shopping, and let's say I'm sorting through a big rack of these things or something, you can just grab a projectile and just do the bullet test. And what you want to look for is, like if I set this projectile in the muzzle and just give it 
kind of a slight pressure on the front. It sits in there nice and straight. You can see that the muzzle doesn't really eat that much of the projectile. That's just kind of a visual reference for the amount of wear uh, that this particular barrel has. And I would say, considering this is a wartime gun, it's probably plugged some Russians. Uh, so it's been shot, all right? That's fine. Uh, this gun will be just a fine shooter. Usually an unissued gun, just to give you a reference, the bullet will eat to about right there. So you can see there's just a little bit of movement. Usually they'll poke out about right there if the gun hasn't been shot much. Obviously if the muzzle eats the projectile all the way up to the mouth of the case, then that's probably a sign this thing's getting close to being shot out. But don't think that it's still not a good shooter because a Milserp gun that has been shot a lot was probably shot a lot because it's accurate. So right out the gate, another thing that we'll note is the adjustable sights. There's a pair of drums. I'm not going to remove the sights because I don't really think it's necessary, but if you want to, uh, you'll take both these drums out on either side of the sight leaf. There's a pair of ears here that protect the front sight post. There's a small set screw that you would take out, and this whole sight assembly will just pop right out. We're going to remove the cleaning rod. It is threaded into place. I just pre-loosened it. All right, so you can see the style of cleaning rod has some very unique looking uh, knurled uh, ridges that are put into the end of the cleaning rod to properly hold a patch. All right, we're going to set that aside. All right, I've got my properly uh, chosen hollow ground screwdriver bit. Brown L's here. We're going to go ahead and remove this screw that is holding the actual barrel band in place. Now it helps to have probably a magnetic tray laying around to throw these in. You do not want to lose these suckers because they are not easy to replace. You don't want to have to make that screw and you don't want to have to replace it, trust me. So we're going to throw them into a magnetic tray here. This is hinged. It opens right up, but before we can remove it, you can probably see right here in the, uh, in the camera angle, this, this head right here of the screw butts up to this side of the barrel band. We have to remove it from the other side. So if you look, there's a screw over here we're just going to remove. Hopefully I can get it out the way I've got this thing chopped up in the vise. Obviously you can tell here that using a vise is an extremely handy measure. I am going to have to move this just a little bit. It's a very handy measure. It's just a couple of bites of thread that's holding that cross, uh, cross screw in that holds this barrel band in place. There's a lot of dried grease and preservatives on this thing, but generally if you just grab it and just kind of wiggle it, it'll generally just kind of pull right down. Do not tap this thing forward. You'll bust the stock. You can see that there's a cut in the stock. This barrel band also contains your uh, bayonet mount. Okay, and just as a a point of reference, if you end up finding a bayonet for an M39, they're going to be more than the gun. The Frisker's bayonets are very handy because it's actually not just a bayonet. It's also like a fighting knife and a survival knife. So generally, they command quite a bit of a premium in terms of price. One thing while we're up here on this camera angle I want to show you is notice the floating of the barrel. Um, you know, I can take this barrel and just gently wiggle it. And one thing that we're noticing is there's some side-to-side -side movement, there's some up-and-down movement. The Finnish military went through great lengths to make sure that their barrels were properly floated up and down. See, a lot of times, sure, they might float the stock, but if the upper handguard is making contact, that can negatively affect barrel harmonics. And they understood that back then, that a good rifle needed to have a free-floating barrel. So just like the K31, the Finnish M39, in a lot of ways, is almost a target rifle disguised as a military rifle. We're going to move back and uh, work our way down the gun. All right, moving down the rifle, we're going to go ahead and take the second barrel band off. One thing that's distinctive that you're definitely going to notice about the M39 versus the 9130 is the dual sling mounts. And that is, for one way, you can mount the sling on there for cavalry troops or mounted troops some bicycles or whatever. And then this is the infantry style of mounting a sling for a rifleman, somebody that's uh, out doing his thing. Also, a ski troop would have mounted a sling there because they would uh, go around and sling these rifles on their back and ski around and kill the crap out of the Russians and then just ski off and just uh, have themselves a field day. There's a screw over here. I know it probably can't be uh, visible in the camera here, but real easy. Just grab this screw counterclockwise. Really easy. 
the way that they uh, put together these rifles and engineered them, they really thought of everything, making sure that they're not creating any odd pinch points or anything like that uh, when they're putting these things together. There's a uh, leaf spring right here that just acts as a barrel band retainer. I guess that's in case your screw comes loose or something. Just uh, depress it gently, slide the barrel band off, and it should clear the sights without the sights having to be removed. See, they thought of everything. All right, at this point, we should be able to just lift the upper handguard right off. It's probably going to be kind of stuck in place a little bit because, yeah, you felt that or heard that kind of breaking. You can see that there's preservatives that were applied uh, to the underside of the guard. And something else that I want to note here, see this? They actually went through and they opened up this handguard, and you can tell that this is something they did after the fact, after the guard was already stained and finished. They came back in and they noticed that there was some pinch points on the barrel. And they purposely came back and opened up those areas so they knew that the front band and the middle band were causing inaccuracy and causing that barrel to physically touch the upper handguard and I guarantee you it was stringing shots or causing uh, some erratic accuracy. Uh, these guns, the, the, the sights are regulated to the D166 ball round which was a 200 grain bullet moving at around 2550 I believe if my memory serves and uh, it's a very very accurate ball round and these guns were expected to shoot into less than two inches so with iron sights. Now granted, the only way they would achieve that accuracy is by inlaying that upper handguard. Now mind you, this has not been removed by me, ever. So this is what the Finns did to this gun. This is not, Bubba didn't do this. This was actually a Finn arsenal to keep that barrel from touching the upper handguard. So you can see there, if you're wanting to get into accurizing military guns, the Finns left us a hint. Let's go ahead and move back down the gun. We're going to go ahead and start disassembling it some more. Before we move back, I want to show you guys something here about the free floating of these barrels. I made sure that the action screws were nice and tight. I've got a pretty thick section of instructions uh, here uh, from Brownells. I'm just going to grab this, slide it in here, and you can see that that barrel floats no problem all the way back here to the, re to the rear sight. So you can see there's plenty of movement and it's just a perfectly fitted barrel and that's one of the things that it's just this level of attention to detail is not something you're going to get in a russian rifle and that's where a lot of people go oh well why is a 9130 100 bucks and a finnish m39 is 300 bucks well that's why because it's just physically a better gun not to mention more rare uh, but we're going to talk more as we go i just wanted to show you that uh, to show these things truly are really fitted well uh, they're excellent guns all right, moving down the rifle, we can see we've got a very old hex receiver, kind of a high wall hex receiver. The way the stripper clip notch is machined on this one is definitely an old style of machining uh, that you're not going to find in a later hex gun. So I, I would imagine this is probably going to be an older receiver. We are going to remove the bolt from the rifle. Very simple, just open it, depress the trigger and the bolt mechanism will just slide right out of the rifle. We can see that it has a bunch of grease all over it. We're probably going to ultrasonic a lot of this metal because we do have a lot of heavy preservatives uh, that are on the gun. We can see right out the gate we've got some very old Russian markings that, that are definitely from an older Russian firearm. Uh, some Definitely some older style markings. A lot of these bolts are going to be original to, this, to the receivers that they were built off of and then they're going to be what's called force match. And what they did is they checked, confirmed the headspace with the new barrel, and then they marked the bolt handle normally in this location. Sometimes they're marked here, but typically they're marked on the, the actual ball of the bolt handle. And it'll have the last four of the serial numbers that's on the barrel. Uh, this is a sky marked gun. I'm going to set this bolt mechanism to the side. This is a sky marked gun, which means it would have been issued to Civil Guard units. And Civil Guard was kind of their equivalent to our National Guard. Uh, but maybe a little bit more stringent rules in terms of their service and the conditions for their service. But the Civil Guard was comprised of volunteers. And, uh, you know, Sim Ohio, one of the most respected uh, marksmen in the Finnish Army from, you know, the early parts of the war there, 
uh, racked up a ton of kills with a sky marked uh, finish M28. Actually, it was either it was M2830 or M27. So it was M2830. M2 and Simo Haya preferred that rifle because the stock was a little bit better. He was a small statured shooter and he preferred the stock on that rifle. And he absolutely slaughtered some Russians with that particular rifle. It just goes to, to show the testament of the accuracy of these rifles. I'm going to go ahead and back out the tang screw. Okay. And I'm gonna, after this, I'm going to invert the rifle. And uh, so it's just a long screw that goes through the tang and into the trigger box or the trigger guard box or the magazine itself. There's a threaded hole in the rear of the magazine that this just screws down into. I'm going to put it in my parts tray. Uh, that's pretty much it there. I'm going to move the rifle. Uh, I'm not really going to be headspacing this particular rifle because I've never known of a Finnish M39 uh, to have problems with headspace, but if you do want to headspace it, it's no different than any other Mosin. You're either going to have to remove the extractor, which I would not recommend doing if you can help it, or you're going to have to take a headspace gauge and grind a flat so that the headspace gauge will clear that extractor. I would strongly recommend grinding a flat instead of trying to remove the extractor. That's really the only weak point on the Mosin is the interrupter si system and the extractor leave a little bit to be desired and if you're not careful you can damage this but I am going to show you how to remove it. This is normally not the position that I would perform this task in uh, on my own if I were doing this just on the bench without filming it but for the purposes of filming I have to really film it this way. We're going to remove the magazine. There's just a little lever here. Just pull it back and it'll hinge open. Hinge it all the way open. Squeeze it. Pull it out. Okay, so this assembly, if you want, you can disassemble it more. I would not recommend doing it. If you want to remove this leaf spring that's powering the magazine follower, you can pull this little screw out. But uh, since the ultrasonic is going to do most of the work here, we're not going to worry with it. And I would not recommend disassembling this. A lot of these pins are fit very tight and you'll probably do more damage uh, then you're going to fix by taking this apart. I would just clean it and put it back when you're done and everything's good. Uh, we're going to remove this screw. Now I'm going to have to actually hold the action together because there's shims oftentimes that are in this uh, action in the stock that I'm going to show you. We're going to back this screw out. That's something that when you're taking these things out of the range you want to really be mindful of. If you want to get the best accuracy out of these rifles, always take a good screwdriver kit, like one of the little brown L sets that's in the red box. That's what I keep in my range bag. Take that kit to the range with you, and before you start sending rounds down range, make sure these action screws are nice and tight. Not farmer tight, but tight. We're going to remove the magazine. All right, that didn't offer any resistance. You can see preservative grease was applied uh, to the inside there to keep it from rusting. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the rifle together, invert it, and then we'll remove, carefully remove the barreled action. One thing about the, the wood that they use for these, it didn't grow very large, so they couldn't really make a single stock out of like one piece of wood. They had actually had to splice the forend and the rear of the stock together to get a stock. And the splicing that they used uh, was like a rounded splicing for a wartime stock. Then they had a transitional splicing uh, that was kind of like a sharp V shape. And then later, you know, after the war, which this is technically a post-war stock, it has square joints. So it very well could be the case that they repaired it or whatever. Uh, but this is definitely a post-war stock by the style of splices uh, that is used here. Uh, that's okay. Not a big deal. We're going to invert it and remove the action. Uh, oftentimes, due to the way that they bedded these things so aggressively in the front, they usually had to resort to some form of metal shims in the stock to really help uh, support the action and provide a good bedding surface. One thing I didn't look for is a lot of times they would bed the magazine as well. Sometimes that was because of feeding issues, like if the magazine wasn't in just the right geometry to feed properly, sometimes they would have to bed it either on the inside of the action or on the bottom side where the magazine was to get the geometry just right. Um, a lot of these stocks were hand inleted 
although many of them were probably made on like a stock duplicator. Uh, a lot of shops back then would have basically like a, a couple of hero rifles laying around in the corner and if they had to get it just right, if they need to take a really precise measurement, they could do so. Um, Alright, so we're just going to grab the sight base and pick up. Alright, and there's our action. I'm going to, ooh, yeah, Let, let's check our attain date here because that's something I was curious about. Okay, this is very, very odd. The tang on this rifle's been scrubbed. So we don't know what date it was, but you can see that there's a ton of preservatives all over the gun. There are some shims here. And we're gonna notate the, the location of the shims. And where they shim this action, it's actually really, really interesting where they shimmed it because uh, they shimmed it actually on the bearing surface of the bottom of the stock and not the recoil lug. So a lot of times you'll you'll see them shim the inside of the recoil lug and like in this case the recoil lug in the stock actually helps handle a brunt of the recoil forces and the fitting of the stock is very important as well. So I'm just going to grab this action and get it out of the way and this thing's really goopy. We're probably going to throw the entire thing in the ultrasonic and let the ultrasonic do the work but we, we're going to disassemble it of course first. So let me set that to the side and we'll get on that in a moment. But that's not bad. I'm going to make note of where these shims are located so that we can make sure the gun is uh, assembled in the same way we took it apart. All right, so we can see the stock is made very well. There's no shimming on the, you know, the magazine well at all. You know, there is some shimming on the inside, but overall, very clean stock. We're going to go through and probably take some Murphys and clean this stock in a moment. But first, we're going to move back. Uh, to the metal works and get that all pulled apart and thrown in the ultrasonic. You can see the very unique pistol grip uh, that's grafted into the M39. It's very comparable to like the scant stocks. That was like a transitional style of stock they used on the Springfield 03s. It has a very scant like quality to it, but it's a very comfortable grip uh, for target work. It's a very, very good overall stock design. Works very well. You can see our dual sling mounts, just like we mentioned up front. So you got your infantry style sling mount and then your cavalry style sling mount. The butt plates that were used on these guns were actually uh, reused from old 91s. So uh, it's perfectly normal to have just a regular uh, Russian butt plate on these. And oftentimes on these stocks, you'll see that the wood is a little bit proud on the back. That's completely normal. Uh, why they did it that way, I'm not sure. Maybe it's because they want a certain profile uh, for the comfort of the shooter, but a standard 91 butt plate is perfectly normal. We're not gonna remove this. I'm not worried at all about anything being going on under the stock, so we're gonna leave all this hardware in place. We're not really gonna remove it. We're gonna move on to the metal. All right, we're gonna disassemble the bolt. This is really easy. This thing has grease and crap all packed into it, so we wanna make sure we disassemble it and clean it well prior to uh, firing it. Um, first thing we're gonna do is look at a couple of things. Now, one thing I didn't mention before is the cocking piece that's on this. See these knurled edges? This is a very early cocking piece. Probably came off of Antique 91, so definitely an older cocking piece. Uh, later in the war, they stopped bothering with these serrations to speed up the manufacturing process. So just some nerdy information for you. Notice the scribe on the back of the bolt is in conjunction with the line that's cut into the rear of the firing pin. It's not always a tried and true t uh, test of, of where the firing pin is set, but make note of it. If you're not familiar with this process, I would suggest taking a photo of this. Uh, but you can see that the line is generally straight, scribed through the middle of the uh, back of the cocking piece and the firing pin itself, and that the firing pin is generally flush with the back of the cocking piece. So make note of where it is, take a photo of it. It'll help you with the uh, reassembly if it's something you haven't done before. First thing that you want to do, and what I like to do, is I like to see if the firing pin protrusion was set well from the factory from the get-go. Go ahead and decock the bolt. And do that simply by just twisting it, holding the rear, twist it, and make sure this is pushed all the way back as far as it'll go to a hard stop. Hold everything in place and you'll see that the firing pin protrudes from the front of the bolt face. Grab a set of uh, digital calipers. Use your, your depth. All right, so put the base of it there and just have your depth pushed down to the front of the bolt face. You can see that the measurement is just over 75 thousandths. 
The minimum firing pin protrusion for an M9130 or finish M39 is 75 thousandths. The maximum firing pin protrusion is 95 thousandths. So you have 20 thousandths worth of play uh, that is considered to be the proper firing pin protrusion. So from the factory, we can see that this finish M39 has perfect firing pin protrusion. I would expect no less. While the bolt is already in the closed position to disassemble it, grab the connecting bar. Just go ahead and pull forward. It might be a little bit difficult to move if it's got a lot of storage grease on it. We're going to set this aside for a moment. Grab the front of the bolt face. There's a cut that's in the side here. Just rotate it all the way over and pull forward. There's your connecting bar. Also off of a very old 91. Very well made. Nice old markings. Very cool. We're going to set that in the tray. We're going to remove the extractor in a moment. We'll come back to it. The bolt body itself, you've got the firing pin, cocking piece, the spring contained within, and then the bolt body. Grab yourself a little bit of real estate somewhere. Like in this case, I've got my rubber jaws. Uh, that's going to be just fine. I've kind of got the firing pin resting in between these pieces of rubber. I'm going to compress the spring all the way. Rotate this cocking piece off the back of the firing pin. Slowly decompress. This thing's nasty. It needs to be cleaned up. Okay. Bolt body. Spring. Intact firing pin. Also an older firing pin. A lot of these parts on the M39 were reused from original uh, 91s and 9130s. Okay. We're going to, let's see, something else I want to show you on the cocking piece. Notice on the cocking piece, you can tell that it has definitely been worked. Uh, this is the sear engagement surface. Uh, when you squeeze the trigger, the trigger actually slips down below and allows the, the cocking mechanism, basically the striker, to fall and ignite the cartridge. You can see that a lot of effort has been made to fit this. You can actually see some cut marks and some tooling marks. They took the time to make sure these triggers were good. And you're going to notice something about the trigger in a minute when we get it apart. They actually have two stage triggers. And I'm going to show you how the fins did that in a moment. I'm going to chalk this up and we're going to go ahead and remove the extractor. Uh, you can see that there's a dovetail cut, uh, kind of an annular and tapered dovetail cut in the back of the bolt itself. This is not something I would recommend anybody doing, but I'm going to show you how to remove it. So... You've, I've warned you, I'm telling you not to do it. But I'm going to show you how to do it. All right, chalk it up to where the lugs actually are bared against the top of the jaws of the vise, but to where the extractor itself can fall free from down below. You're not, you're not pinching the extractor where you're trying to drive it out. All right, so you want to go ahead and chalk it up. You can see that we've got it in this position. You can see the orientation. Um, we're going to remove the extractor, but there's also something I want to show you guys about the orientation of the bolt face. One way that you can tell how shot out a gun is, is by the condition of the bolt face. And one thing you want to look at is erosion in the area around the firing pin right here. Uh, you can definitely, if, if you start to see like a ring of pitting right here or anything like that, or a ring of pitting around this area, chances are this bolt has been shot to hell and back. Now granted, these were because they came off of original service rifles and the fins just reused them. Something else you can do while you have the bolt out, obviously the bolt's apart, you can take a live cartridge or a piece of brass or whatever and you can check the fit in the bolt face and you can see that it's a good solid fit. We don't think there's going to be any problems there. Now if I had to force that into place and really work hard to force that, one thing that you can do to fix that is sometimes these edges, because it's a rimmed cartridge, these edges are kind of thin right here around the front of the bolt face, and sometimes those can get peeled over. In fact, if you look, you can see in the shot, it's slightly peeled over right there. Now, that's not enough to matter, but I've seen some of these that have a good bit of a bend right there, and that can cause the cartridge to be very difficult for the bolt to overcome the cartridge when you're chambering it. So guys that have to slap their bolt handle shut that's probably why. All right, we're going to move the uh, extractor out. Best way to do it is to grab a punch that fits about the same size as the top of the extractor. Don't do this. That's how people break them. They hit it this angle and it'll just, it's not good. You want to hit it about this angle right here. It 
gently. It does not take a bunch of manhandling. I'm just going to let it, let's see. There we go. All right. I'm going to reach under there and grab it. All right, there's our extractor. This is a finish produce extractor that's been replaced. You can tell by the plum color. That's the unique style of heat treating they used uh, that can give it that plum color. They might have got the they might have heat treated this just a little bit on the hot side and when when it was finished it'll turn that kind of plum color and that's how you get that is from the bluing salts being really hot so when they made these extractors they probably threw them in the bluing tank and that's why it got that plum color because it's such a small piece of material it got hot really quick and it turned that plum color so that's normal let's move on all right we should be able to pretty much uh, get to everything right here uh, for taking the trigger group out of the gun uh, and I'll show you the way that the fins did this two-stage trigger that's really awesome in the uh, Fin M39. One thing right out the gate, we've got the uh, interrupter, and everything is a two-piece interrupter. So this is a later interrupter. A lot of the early ones were one piece. You can see it's two pieces. I mean, if I grab this, pick up on it, it it'll move, and you can see the interrupter just stays put. Um, this screw is kind of boogered up, so you want to make sure that you select a, a bit that fills the entire slot up as much as possible. Uh, that's probably going to work just fine. We're going to go ahead and, and be very careful. The two parts on a Mosin that are most commonly broken or lost are this screw and this pin that holds the trigger in place because it's just like a friction fit. It's not, it's not there. It's not staked in place. It's not screwed in place. Uh, so these parts are commonly lost. You want to be very careful. We're going to be very careful here. Okay, that moved just fine, and it was already boogered up, so that's not good. Uh, that was, I guess, somebody at the Finnish Arsenal was in a hurry or something. Uh, that could be dressed if we wanted. That could be replaced, but I'll tell you what, we're not going to mess with it. I'm going to throw it in the parts tray. To remove the extractor, the best way to do it is just grab a punch and like the scribe like this, or the, the interrupter, I'm sorry, lift up like this, put something in between there, be very careful doing this because if you get this punch at the wrong angle and you're you're hitting on this, you're going to jack up the threads in the receiver and you're going to be up uh, you're going to be up the Volga without a paddle. All right, so let's uh, very gently. I'm I'm using a lot of care to make sure I don't get anywhere near those threads. I do not want to booger those up. You can see the punch has completely cleared the threads. Nowhere near that. All right. Okay. That's one piece of our interrupter. I got a whole tray of parts going on over here. And then our other piece is right here. You can just take a scribe, lift it against this little ledge, and it pulls right out. Note the orientation of the interrupter. It needs to be in this position. If you install it backwards, the rounds are just going to pop out of the magazine. It's not going to feed properly. So you can see the position of the interrupter goes like this. We'll cover that when we reassemble it. But very dirty, definitely needs to be cleaned. All right, for the trigger itself, we're going to go ahead and knock this trigger pin out so we don't lose it. You really shouldn't even need a hammer to get it out. Just to show you how well they fall out, just grab a punch and push it. And it'll just generally fall right out. Do not lose that pin. It, it, it's commonly lost and they're, they're not easy to replace. Okay. We're going to change out to a larger bit that fits this uh, big monstrous screw right here that holds the uh, sear in place. <clears throat> that took a good bit of force to break. It's not a very tall screw. It's, it's kind of short. We're just going to pull this entire unit out. This is the position that the trigger goes in in the gun. You can see the screw that retains it. There's kind of a rounded cut that's put into this bar right here. And obviously, because this thing is so dirty, we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about it. We want to clean it first. But you can see the way that the fins put these two pins right here. And they're in a very precise location, and that's to provide a, a two-stage trigger. So when you squeeze the trigger, there's a stage that's taken up and it bears against one of these pins, and then the rest of the brake is against one of the other pins. So this is something that the 
the Finnish military did to this trigger to improve it over standard 9130. And that's how uh, you can get a two-stage trigger in your Mosin. So say you have a 9130 that you love to shoot, but you don't like the trigger and you want a slightly better trigger. Work the cocking piece like I showed you before, and you can buy a Finnish M39 trigger for about 40 bucks. So if you want the two-stage trigger, just buy a Finnish M39 trigger. They are available and they are out there in surplus and they are affordable. I wouldn't even bother trying to make one yourself. I would just buy a, a surplus one and install it in your 9130. That's pretty much it. Uh, this action stripped. We're going to go drop all the metal parts in the ultrasonic. And we're going to move on to the stock. All right, well, we got a uh, Lyman Power Pro. This is a nice big ultrasonic here. I've got it loaded down with hot water and Simple Green. We've preheated it. Uh, we're going to use this to help cheat a little bit. We're going to drop the action in here. Now, one thing I didn't mention, we did not remove the rear sight. Uh, I wouldn't do it. Uh, there's really no point. That's just my opinion, but we're going to go ahead and uh, drop all the metal in here. And be careful because these ultrasonics get pretty dang hot. And obviously, we'll have to kind of flip this back around and everything. And we're going to drop all the metal works in here. Uh, this particular ultrasonic I got through Brownells. Um, they carry these, and I tell you, Lyman makes some great stuff. Uh, you can't go wrong with any Lyman product. I've, I've had very good luck with everything from presses, reloading dies. Uh, they're just a great bunch of guys. They make some good snap caps as well. You know, a lot of people don't realize that like the little red A-Zoom uh, snap caps that you get are made by Lyman. They do a good job. So obviously some of these parts are kind of tiny. Um, I don't really have a smaller basket. To put them in we're just going to drop them in there and let them cook regardless uh the extractor i'm not going to put in there and this trigger pin and this other so basically the ones that get lost all the time we're not even going to bother putting those in there uh, this fell out of stock earlier this is actually like a little grommet that goes in the stock to hold the cleaning rod in place you can see it's very robust very large we'll put it in there and let it cook and uh all the screws we're not going to bother ultrasonicing those because they don't really have any. And eh, that one's got some crud in it. We'll put him in there and that screw's fine. So the screws we're not going to worry about. We're going to go ahead and let this puppy cook while we uh, mess with the stock. All right, we're going to have a look at the stock. We've got a bunch of dried oil and everything on it that we're going to try to just gently remove with some Murphy's oil soap and warm water. We do not want to harm the original finish. All we want to do is get the storage grease and everything that was on the rifle off of it so it's good to shoot. Uh, a lot of times on these guns, you'll see a lot of oil soak in this area, primarily around the you know, bottom part of the buttstock. And that's because, obviously, when these are stored, a lot of that oil will kind of seep down and work its way into the stock. Uh, we don't want to refinish it. We don't want to remove the finish. All we want to do is just gently clean it. Now, we are using ultrasonic there to clean all the metal parts. If you don't have an ultrasonic, just get yourself a big old turkey pan with some hot water and simple green and a you know, pair of good solid gloves, rubber gloves. Get you a couple of good you know, solid bristle toothbrushes and just you're going to have to apply some elbow grease and just clean all that stuff off of there. You can use mineral spirits, but I wouldn't recommend it because it could harm the bluing. You don't want to mess with your finish. Simple green and hot water. You know, hot water is one of nature's most productive solvents. It works the best. I mean, I like to use water. so. We're just going to grab a little slice of pot scrubber here and we're just going to get some of this Murphy's on it and we're going to gently just go over the stock and uh, remove just some of this loose oil that's on the outside of the stock. And believe me, I can already feel that that's taking it right off. So it's, it's just going to take a very light passing with this oil soap. And uh, when we're done, we are going to apply like maybe just a very light coat of stock wax to this. And, uh, and it's going to be just fine. We're going to let the heat do the work. Like earlier, we mentioned that we weren't going to take the uh, hardware off. I just use the pot scrubber to just clean the hardware while it's on the gun. Uh, many times that hardware can actually get kind of, uh, you know, the stock will kind of expand and contract with the weather from time to time. And sometimes some of this stuff can get kind of hard to remove and you don't want to force it because you don't want to split any of these little crevices that this hardware is set into. Uh, likely would never be a problem for most people, but for my purposes, I just prefer not to remove the hardware because we don't want to run into any issues. A little bit of adhesive there, we're just going to get off. 
And this pot scrubber, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's going to screw the wood up. It won't. It won't harm it one bit, guys. We're letting the pot scrubber do all the work. You can see some goo right there. It's just It uh, really does a great job of uh, just cleaning up the wood. All we're trying to do is clean it. We don't want to... We don't want to do anything but clean it. We're going to go through with the Murphy's oil soap and a little warm water. Let the water do the work. Then we're going to go through with paper towels and we're going to dry this stock off really well. And we're probably going to go grab some lunch and let the ultrasonic kind of do the work here. And once everything's dry, we'll come back and put a coat of stock wax on the stock. We are not harming the original finish. Everything's fine. You want to make sure you pay special attention to the barrel channel because you get preservatives and grease in the actual channel here. Go ahead and give it a little elbow grease. You're not going to hurt it. But you want to get all that oil and everything out of there. You don't want that stuff harming your stock. All right, we're just going to grab a paper towel here and just dry the stock off. We can see the original finish is intact. We have not the original finish. All right. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we're just going to wipe her down. Looks good. We got a good bit of the surface oils off of the stock. Not really going to harm anything. Uh, looks pretty good. There's still some oil on the stock right there. So I think you guys get the idea. We're going to go through and just carefully, meticulously try to clean every little bit of oil off of the stock. Uh, it's mostly surface oil. Some of it is impregnated into... Uh, the, the surfaces of the stock and obviously we want to make sure that that's all removed so I'm gonna finish that up and we'll get her dried up and uh, once the stock dries and ultrasonic is uh, clear we get it all out of there and dried off we'll uh, wax the stock and reassemble the rifle we've pretty much gotten the stock dried like we want most of the oils are out we're gonna go ahead and proceed to put some stock wax on this thing just to protect the stock a little bit and uh, brighten up the finish a little bit didn't clean up too bad. Uh, the metal works. I went ahead and pulled everything out of the ultrasonic, dried it off, oiled it. Uh, I did swab the bore with a Tipton cleaning rod here. Uh, everything looks good. The board looks fine. So pretty much just uh, good to wax the stock and put the gun back together. I'm going to try my best to work kind of quick. We've got some gunny paste here. Uh, you guys know we like using this stuff. It's actually a formula that, uh, like an NRA recommended formula. And uh, we may this stuff ourselves and it tends to go a pretty long way we're actually getting kind of near the end of this batch we need to make some more that's probably something that'll be a future video we'll make some gunny paste but it's just a great preservative for the wood helps protect it doesn't change or alter the original finish in any way we're going to go through and just apply it uh, by hand and it's literally like a wax on wax off type thing so you're just going to wipe it on and then uh, let it kind of sheen over into a little bit of a film and then you're going to just wipe it dry with a towel. So it's best to just put on some gloves and get after it. There's really no better way to explain this other than you just got to go for it. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to get the stock waxed up. As you can see here, we're just applying the wax to the stock and we'll get her dried off. Very simple process. The wood's kind of thirsty. Yeah, after that, uh, after all that water on it, you know, it'll, it'll kind of dry it out a bit. And this stock wax is just going to help re-moisturize the stock and protect it. Everything like that. So, not a problem. We got a really good looking stock here. These Finish M39 stocks are always really nice. So, I'm going to go ahead and get this uh, task completed. And we'll move along to the reassembly. Here's all the parts for our bolt. We're going to go ahead and assemble our bolt while our stock wax is kind of curing up. It needs to kind of sit uh, before we wipe the stock off, so we're not quite ready there. But we are going to put the bolt together. And uh, guys, I'm going to work kind of quick because this video is already getting kind of long. We've covered most of the important bases that you need to know uh, with this kind of thing. I've got an armorer's block here that I got through Brownells. Uh, again, I, I shop a lot there, so... If I throw their name out a bit, forgive me. You can see that the extractor fits uh, in this little hole in the armor's block. It's going to protrude past the bolt face, so you want to make sure you got clearance for it. Place the bolt face down. Place the extractor in there, making sure that there's room for it to clear in the armor's block. Just like that. 
hold it together like this. Make sure there's room to clear and just beat that sucker back in place. All right, it'll be flush. You can see it cleared the armor's block. Everything looks good. So there's our bolt face. We're gonna go ahead and put the bolt back together. All right, we're gonna take firing pin, firing pin spring, put it together, and it goes this way. All right, so spring, firing pin, bolt body, the little beveled edge, the back side of the bolt body. Let's go ahead and compress it all the way. Take the cocking mechanism, screw it in until the firing pin is flush, about like that, okay? Decock it. Actually, take your connecting bar and bolt head, and they go in this position. You can see the groove it's cut, pretty self-explanatory. Um, decock the bolt, line up the, you can see these two little forks in the connecting bar coincide with this cut uh, where the striker is. Go ahead and just kind of line everything up and you have to play with it, kind of rotate it into place like this. All right, everything looks good. We're gonna grab our uh, calipers and we're gonna check our firing pin protrusion while the bolt is decocked. And again, guys, I'm working quickly. Eighty thousandths. So ninety-five thousandths is too much firing pin protrusion. Seventy-five thousandths is minimum firing pin protrusion. So this firing pin protrusion is good. Hold the bolt mechanism by the cocking area there and cock the bolt. This bolt is good to go and it's ready to drop back in the rifle and use. So there's your bolt mechanism. We're gonna set him to the side. We're done with him for now. All right, guys, again, working in real time, we're gonna install all the stuff back onto the receiver. We've got the magazine body to replace the follower and everything. Just take and, uh, you know, you can kind of fix your how it goes in there. S squeeze it together. It'll, it'll kind of uh, coincide with this little bar in here. Squeeze it back together to kind of snap in place and close it. All right, magazine body's good to go. We're gonna set him to the side. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, put some of the action back together while we're waiting on the stock to cure up good. Uh, here's our interrupter assembly. You can see it goes in this position. Just place it in there. It also acts as your ejector as well. That's what that little tab holding off of there does. And to put this back in, this is the spring that powers it. Push it all the way down the bottom of the groove and just give it some forward motion with your hands. And it should just slide right in. It actually should not require any force to put in. We're gonna put this screw back in place and it should just kinda go right down. Now that head is boogered up, but it was that way when we got the gun, so it's nothing we did. All right, so that's intact. The trigger goes in here in this orientation, like this. All right, and you can see the two distinct, like if I take this trigger, or the uh, sear itself, and I pull it, up and down like this, I can feel two distinct bumps and that's where that two-stage trigger comes from. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna place the trigger back in there and this big old honking screw right here is what holds it in place. We're just gonna put it back in the bottom here. And of course this was covered up with grease earlier and it came out of the ultrasonic. Nice and clean, good and clean. All right. All right, we're gonna tighten that up. This pin I told you not to lose, you're gonna put it back in here just like this. And just kind of finish your home a little bit. All right, that's actually a nice tight fit. That pin shouldn't come out, but sometimes, you know, it, it will. You gotta be really careful. So that's pretty much it for what we are gonna put back on the action. One thing I am gonna do while I've got the camera rolling the underside of the barrel here, we've wiped down really well. It's nice and clean. It cleaned up really good. But because we want to protect it really well, I'm going to take some uh, LPS-3 
This is actually a, a very, very, very awesome protectant. And this thing will definitely never rust once we've applied this LPS-3. It kind of imparts a bit of a, uh, a waxy coating uh, to anything that you apply it to. They actually use this stuff on airplanes. Like they, they buy the stuff by like the 55 gallon drums and they coat the outside of airplanes to help with corrosion resistance and to help with like a wind drag and, and other little particulates catching the plane. So this LPS-3 is some great stuff. I'm just gonna apply a light coat of it to the sides and, and bottom of the action so that we don't get any corrosion down the road because this is a, a gun that's going to be put in uh, relatively long-term storage. It's going to be shot a good bit, but it's also going to be stored and we don't want this uh, nice pretty blue and going bad on us. I'm just going to spray it off camera here. Now, I don't recommend this stuff for I don't recommend using this for something that's going to get used all the time because it will actually form a very waxy layer that it can build up tolerance and that might be an issue for some of you. So I would only put it on areas that aren't really going to be used much. So there it is. Uh, the action looks great. Uh, as soon as we get our stock wiped down, which I think we're about ready to do, we'll go ahead and get this thing uh, assembled. All right, where our stock cleaned up really nice, we basically just went through and wiped off all the excess uh, stock paste off, cleaned up nicely. We're gonna go ahead and proceed to get her reassembled here. Looking beautiful, which it's an M39, so of course it is. We're gonna put our shim back in there that we marked very carefully, okay? So that our shim is in exactly the same location. Don't forget to drop your cleaning rod ferrule back in here. It's just a little threaded block that drops into this little slot in the stock. Doesn't matter which direction you drop it in, it's the same from either direction. Just make sure that goes back in there. Little LPS-3 on the bottom of the uh, action here. I'm gonna place it back into the stock, making very careful note to not move our shims. All right, I'm gonna take the magazine and I'm just going to fish it in from the bottom here, being very careful. And I'm going to put this top tang screw in just to kind of help hold everything in place. Okay. And again, I'm wearing these gloves because I don't want to get my fingerprints or, you know, anything that can cause rust on the, on the firearm. So during, during reassembly, I would always recommend wearing a uh, pair of gloves. Now, I'm not going to cinch these screws down super tight just yet. I just want to hold it in place. And uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. All right, I've just got that front screw just started. I'm not going to cinch it down just yet uh, because we're going to go through and, and finish out everything with the front barrel bands and the front of the stock and everything. So I'm going to move this back to right here. And I'm going to move this and just set the toe down on the bench just like this. I'm not going to pinch this thing gorilla tight. We don't want it doing anything too stupid. Now the action's moving around. That's fine. I haven't tightened down the screws yet. All right, so moving up to the uh, front of the rifle, we're going to place the upper handguard back in place. One thing I didn't show you from before that I kind of forgot to mention that we discovered after the fact is that you notice these marks in here where they fit the upper handguard. There's also marks on the lower nose portion of the stock where they fitted the stock up front where it was making some contact as well. Just something interesting to uh, point out there. All right, so front uh, handguard drops right in place. One thing I've noticed here that is probably not really worth uh, trying to mess with in terms of fixing, but something I want to mention is that the handguard is cracked. I mean, it's, it's actually got a pretty good little split in it. Uh, that's not something we did. I noticed that when we initially took the gun apart. It's not going to negatively affect the function of the firearm at all. We're going to place the barrel band back in place, obviously with the sling swivels uh, to the left and down. And we're going to take this screw, drop it back in. You don't want to get monkey tight on this particular screw, but you, want to, you definitely want to tighten it down a bit. Okay. 
The front band is going to go on like this, just pushes in place. And I'd go ahead and capture it with the cross screw first, just like this. And I know you can't see it, but I promise you I'm just turning the screw. And this one you can cinch down. Not super tight, but you can you can get it a little tight. You definitely don't want that cross screw coming out because it is a real bear to replace. As is this screw. So you, obviously you're going to just hinge the band back over and screw this in. Don't get it super tight. Okay. That looks good. All right, we're going to go back and tighten our tang screws, put the bolt in place, make sure everything works, do a functions test. All right, well, we've gotten our action screws torqued down nice and tight. Just like before, our barrel is still free floating just like it needs to be, so that means we don't have any pinch points. This should be a really accurate shooter, no problems. Uh, we're going to place the bolt back into the rifle, just make sure everything works. Nice two stage trigger. Let's see what that uh, what that trigger is breaking out. It had a whole bunch of goo and crap earlier, and it was like six and a half pounds. Let's see if cleaning it up made a difference. Six pounds, twelve ounces. That might have been the angle I was pulling at. Let me try again. Six pounds, six ounces. That's about the reading that we were getting earlier. The first stage of the trigger is about 3.9 ounces, or three pounds, nine ounces. And then your second stage, the final stage, breaks at six pounds, six ounces. Which for a military trigger, and mind you, for a Mosin, is pretty good. Six pounds, nine ounces. So, not bad. Okay, so everything looks good there. Uh, I'm not worried about headspace, but at this point, if you want to drop in and check the headspace, you could. Um, I don't have my headspace gauges here. They're actually up at the other shop. Uh, but headspace is a really easy thing. We discussed it earlier. If you want, you can even uh, assemble the bolt without the extractor in if you want to drop in and check the headspace. Or, like I said, you can modify a headspace gauge to drop right in. All right, I took the liberty of installing a period correct sky marked web sling. Uh, for this particular rifle, so that'll complete the Civil Guard Sky lineage. So we've got a, a reproduction Sky marked uh, sling. And I'm not going to lie, these things are a real bear to put on. Uh, we didn't show that because it took us a little bit of playing around to get it on there. But I tell you what, since I went through all the effort to clean this gun up, I get to be the first one to fire it. So I'm going to load up some rounds and we're going to make this little girl talk again. Let's do it. All right, well, all that work and no play would definitely make me a dull boy. So I'm going to take a few shots with the M39 here. We've got some 180 grain Winchester soft point ammo. We got a, a uh, not a coyote, but a gopher down there that has given us a problem. Let's see if we can hit him at 100 yards. <laughs> Not bad. Let's we'll see if we can hit that 10 inch plate down there. Uh, looks slightly right. Yep. This thing's still a little oily. <laughs> see what we got here. Just over the top of it. All right. A little bit of sight regulation is in order. I mean, this is the first uh, rounds that the gun's fired. I can see that that, uh, that sight's pushed over a good bit. It might need to have some adjustment made, but we can put the gun on paper at a later date. And we are going to be doing a full review on 
a bunch of these M39s that we've got, so be expecting that. There we go. All right, well, smooth shooting rifle. Can't go wrong with a fin. Thanks for watching today's video. We had a lot of fun cleaning up this Fin M39. Hopefully, if you guys are into these guns, uh, you learned a little bit from the video. Maybe you can safely disassemble your gun without messing anything up. That's kind of what the whole purpose of the video was. Maybe you've been on the fence about buying an M39 and you don't know what makes an M39 better than a 9130. Well, maybe now you know. So we tried to uh, cover a lot of uh, bases in the video. We appreciate your support. Appreciate you watching. Uh, we got a lot more on the way. Stay tuned. We'll see you.